My name is Robert Griffith. We're at the Burleson Public Library. This interview is being given by the Veterans History Project and the Burleson Heritage Foundation. Today is Wednesday, April the 30th, 2008. I'm here with Carla Jean Dorman Vidra. Uh, did I get that right? Vidra. Vidra, okay. And let's see, you were born on June 26, 1959. You served in the U.S. Air Force. And would you like to go ahead and just tell a little bit about yourself, or would you like to introduce yourself? Or? Well, my name is Carla Dorman, as Mr. Griffith alluded to, and this is my twin sister, Karen Vidra. I live with her, and, or she lives with me both ways. Anyway, um, I was, am the daughter of, the sister of, the cousin of, and nieces of veterans. Um, my dad was in the United States Air Force. My brother was in the United States Air Force. My dad's brothers were in the Army Air Corps, regular Army, and Navy. My one uncle, um, Andrew C. Vidra, was a POW from Bataan, survivor of that. He passed away several years back. Um, he is a hero in my eyes. All of the military. So there's a very strong military presence in our family. And um, I joined because of that and also because I wanted to travel. And at the time I joined, there were no jobs available. So I joined the United States Air Force in 1983. Well, uh, where were you born? Mansfield, Ohio. What was Mansfield like? It was a small t city uh, at that time. Um, actually, we lived in Ontario, Ohio, which was west of Mansfield. It was just a regular, quiet neighborhood. Everybody knew everybody. Um, you could leave your house and your car was unlocked. You didn't worry about crime. Everybody took care of their neighbors, checked down everybody. It was just a very nice, nice time to grow up in. I miss that. What was your education like? Well, I went through a high school. I went to Bedford Elementary and then junior high school at Ontario Junior High and then Ontario Senior High School in Ohio. Graduated in 1978 and I have one semester of college. Not a whole lot, but something. Well, what got you into the Air Force? You mentioned a lot of relatives served. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of stories did you hear growing up that inspired you into the end of service? Well, um, I wanted to know more about my uncle Andrew's service um, and his subsequent um, imprisonment as a prisoner of war during the Bataan Death March but he would never talk about it. I regret not hearing that and seeing what he went through, but um, I went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and they have an Air Force Museum there and he has some artifacts. Like he had a diary, he had um, uh, clothes made from a blanket. and uh, That was very impressive to me that he would, that wasn't found. He would have been killed if they had found that on him. And uh, my dad's stories of when he was in the service. And uh, he Where? was in Japan. He was at uh, Osaka and Hokkaido, Japan. Lived there for three years. He was also in Korea. He was in during the Korean War. And uh, he, I remember the funny stories he told about his sledding and his roller skating adventures, and he'd celebrate getting promoted and go out and have a good time and get busted to buck ass private. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember the funny stories he told. And, yeah. That's about it. So how did you get in? Well, like I said, I wanted to travel. And there were no jobs, so on my dream sheet they ask you where you want to go the first five places. So on mine I had Alaska, 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 Japan. Alaska, and I went Lackland, Carswell, Lackland, Carswell, Lackland, Carswell. I never left Texas. <laughs> so here I am in Texas still, all this time later. What kind of training did you go through? I went through OJT on the job training because um, I had already gone through a vocational school in Ohio for medical dental assisting. And since I already had that training, I just went OJT and I was sent to Carswell and I was at Carswell. What was uh, being at Carswell like back then? It was Strategic Air Command. We called it Stuck at Carswell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it seemed like if you got stationed at Carswell, you didn't leave. Um, I liked Carswell. I loved the people I worked with. Um, 
the patients I took care of. Um, I injured my back twice in the service. And that's why I went to Lackland, was to have medical treatment or surgery. But um, at Carswell, I met a lot of good people. And at the time I was in, we had 25 bed wards. You had one room with 25 beds in it, and you were assigned like eight or 10 patients. And you took care of those eight or 10 patients, doing their vital signs, giving them baths. We did everything a nurse could do except give them medication. We were medical service specialist technicians, as you would call them CNAs now, certified nursing assistants. This is all during the Cold War. What were your impressions of the, the risk of attack from the Soviets? I'm sorry? What was your thoughts on being attacked by the Soviets, if that ever happened? I, did, I was ready to serve. If they'd sent me anywhere, I would have gone. I would not have wanted to go to war, but if called upon, I would have, yes. But I didn't really give it much thought, because that was... That was back in the 50s and early 60s. I was in during the 80s. Well, still, there was quite a threat in the 80s. Yeah. Well, what were your, uh, <clears throat> what were your, some of your duties? You just mentioned watching after, watching after patients. Mm -hmm. what, what else did you do? Uh, well, we did everything an RN did, except give medications. We um, did vital signs. We checked blood sugars. With the doctor's order and with nursing supervision, we could start and stop IVs. We could pass catheters, nasogastric or tubes down the nose to drain the stomach. Uh, we would help them walk after surgery. What kind of what kind of patients did you see? We had all kinds. Um, I usually worked on the medical or geriatric floor. I worked postpartum, which was after pregnancy after the babies were born. We took care of the mothers. Um, labor and delivery on occasion. Um, oncology, cancer floor. And um, I also worked a lot of orthopedics. I really liked orthopedics. <laughs> had good doctors. What was your, while you were in the service, what did you think about being in the service? What was it like? I loved it. I liked the, um, I grew up a lot after basic training. I, I thought I was very immature before, but real quick you mature fast in the Air Force. I have my TI Tech Sergeant Hallie A. Verdell to thank for that. She may be the person I am today, after my parents. Um, it was very regimented, but I liked that because you had a set schedule to go by and you followed that to the best of your ability. If you had a day off, I lived on base, so if you had a day off and they called you in, you didn't argue, you went in. Well, you lived on base. What did you do for recreation? Um, I would go to the movies, um, walk around the base, go to the lake. They have a lake out of Carswell. Um, go to the mall, right off the base. <laughs> I didn't do a lot. Did you associate with many people on base? Yeah, friendships? On base, yes, I had several good friends. One was in supply, her name was Leanne. She was my best friend at that time. We had a good time. We would just go to different places. Well, tell, tell a little bit about that, about um, your friendships. Well, I met Leanne in 1983, and uh, she had been stationed in Korea. So I thought that was really interesting. So she would get mad and she'd use this one particular phrase, which I do not use. <laughs> and. Um, I would ask her what it meant. She'd tell me, never mind, you don't need to know. Well, I met a lady from Korea. Curiosity killed the cat, they say, but satisfaction brought her back. So I asked the lady what it meant, and she slapped me. Well, it turned out that I was asking her, or telling her that her mother was bald in a certain location on her body, <laughs> and it wasn't the head. So needless <laughs> to say, I do not use that phrase anymore. <laughs> I remember that one very, very well. Um, we would go out to she lived off base. Go over to her house. Sometimes we'd go out to the bar, do a little drinking. Not too bad, but we'd have fun. <laughs> go to the movies. We had a good time. What were your superiors like? Well, the one that made a very distinct impression on me was Captain Wright. She was an RN, and she was a very good, fair supervisor. Um, she'd assign tasks to you, and if she 
she liked how you did your job, she would give you more responsibility, and I appreciated that. I really liked her. What kind of... Oh, boy. What kind of responsibility would she give you when you um, did something well? She would just um, let you... She would watch you um, do a procedure and tell you whether you were doing well or not. And she would let you practice so you would gain confidence in the procedure, and then she would just let you go and do it. She would tell me, Carla, I need you to do this procedure. Yes, ma'am. And I would do the procedure. And she'd go back and behind the check, and thank God I did it right every time. <laughs> what was the most stressful aspect of your job? Wondering if somebody was going to die on your shift. I did not want that to happen on my shift. Did it ever happen? Yes. I had one gentleman had an aneurysm bust in his abdomen, and um, his heart stopped, so we were doing CPR, and I was doing mouth to mouth, and he regurgitated blood in my mouth, so it was beyond saving. It was really gross. Ugh. Yeah, but there, there were so many other patients there that I took care of that I still remember them. There was one lady I took care of her. I won't use her name, uh, but uh, she had cancer, and she had been fighting it for years. I don't remember what kind anymore, but she'd been fighting it for years, and she came to the hospital to die. And uh, every day I would walk in her room, and she had a little stuffed cat, a little white cat, on her bed, and I would ask her how she was feeling and everything, and she'd say, um, you forgot to say hello to the kitty. So I'd have to say hello to the kitty and pat it. Well then one night um, I was working on the postpartum floor. They were real busy in labor and delivery, and they, all the nurses had to be over in L&D because they were having babies. They had something like 15 babies born that night. <laughs> So I had to watch the floor. I was in charge of the floor. I couldn't give medications, but I could um, give, um, hang regular IVs or um, change catheters or whatever. And um, if somebody needed medication, I would write it down that at this time they requested pain medication. Well, this lady's husband came up to the floor and told me his wife had passed away. And he handed me her little kitty and said that he wanted me to have it, to remember her by, and I still have that little kitty on my bed. That lady was sweet, sweet, sweet. Made a very good impression on me. I loved her and her husband. It really hurt. I um, also had a colonel's wife who had just had surgery, and she went to shock, and I caught her blood pressure was dropping. And I was the one who noticed it. So I called the nurse. So they came in, and they were able to save her life. So the colonel would come in and tell me, you were the one who saved my life. And that meant a lot to me. What ended up taking you out of the service? I injured my back. Um, How did you do that? Well, the first time I injured my back, I was helping to move a patient from the bed to the, no, from the stretcher to the bed. She had gone to... Uh, another facility to get radiation for cancer treatment and I was helping her to move her back to the bed and I slipped and pulled my hamstring I thought because I had done that in basic training doing a stretch and it was the same pain got her back to bed and I just kind of ignored it well it just kept every time I would stand up or sit down it just kept getting progressively worse and progressively worse so finally I went to the doctor and uh, I was admitted to the hospital, so I was soon found out what it was like on the other end of the chart. And um, I was in the hospital for two months, going through testing and therapy. Well, they discharged me from the hospital in July, and in August I was flown down to Wilford Hall to have emergency back surgery. And um, I did real well. I had, at that time, the Air Force's top neurosurgeon, uh, Hugh Moncrief do my surgery. And he was such a good doctor. I was up walking that night, unaided, without crutches, because I had been on crutches. He was awesome. They let me recuperate for a month, 
and then I went back to work and they were supposed to cross train me, take me out of lifting patients and put me behind the desk, maybe doing the paperwork. Well, I was a good medic, so they said, we need you to continue being a medic. So I went back to lifting patients. And a year to the day after I had my surgery, I was making a bed with a patient in the bed. And uh, she had Alzheimer's. And I had, she was pretty much bedridden. She couldn't get out of bed. And I was making the bed with her, and it's called an occupied bed. And I had the side rails on the far side of the bed up. And on my side, they were down so I could tuck in the sheets. And I was tucking in the sheets. And I had told her, please lie on your back, don't move. Well, she decided to roll. And instead of rolling to the side with the rails up, she rolled out on me, pinned my arms, and I caught her across the shoulders and fell with her. Unhinged everything, so. For 25 years now, I've lived with back pain. And um, I was flown back down to Wilford Hall. I was in the hospital there for four months, going more therapy and testing. But they didn't do any surgery that time. They said there was nothing they really could do. They said it was all scar tissue. If they cut it out, it would come back twice as bad as before and learn to live with it. So then after I got out of the hospital, I went back to, the, back to Carswell. And I was on the floor about two months three months. And they came and said, um, we're giving you we're giving you an honorable discharge. So I was discharged on tax day, April 15th, 1985, from the United States Air Force. What did you do afterwards? Well, I was married at the time um, to another Air Force man. He worked on uh, B-52s. I don't know exactly what. I would ask him what he did, and he'd say, I'd tell you, but I'd have to kill you. So I guess it was high sacred stuff. So, <laughs> and uh, I had a child and a son, but then the marriage did not work. So we wound up getting divorced, and he wound up with custody of the son. And it's real painful memories. Well, what's happened in the years since? Um, well, I worked at Golden Corral in Burleson as a cashier for eight years. I moved my twin sister down here nine years ago. She worked at Golden Crow for almost six years. She worked in the back doing dishes. And um, I started developing a lot of more problems in my neck and in my back. So um, people aren't hiring if you, I use a cane now. Um, people aren't hiring, so I'm trying to get my disability increased because right now I'm living on $230 a month. And I'm trying to get my twin sister on SSDI because she got sick at the end of 2006, almost lost her. And uh, right now she has no income, so we're living on my income. It's not easy. I've heard they've lost some of my records, so until they find those records, they can't do anything. But um, I've and got several people. In looking. the midst of all this, you write poetry. Yes, I do. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, on September 11th, um, I would say on a dark day in, in 2001, one life was saved and it was mine. Because before, I was bitter and angry. I wasn't able to express my emotions. I had lost my mother 18 years ago. Sorry. You need me to stop for a minute? No. Um, and I wasn't able to cry for six months. I was angry and bitter. And Losing my son, the, the, the custody, was another pain that I held in. Well, on September 11th, I had turned on the TV to watch the news and for background noise. And the first plane went in, I thought an accident, and then here comes the second plane. And I knew right then we were under attack. I knew right then. And uh, I had to go to work. I was still working at Golden Corral. Went to work, my twin wouldn't watch TV. That scared her too much. She was practically under the bed, I think. And uh, during the day, my boss would go back to watch the TV. You all right? Mm -hmm. My boss would uh, go back and watch TV. When he came out one time, the look on his face, I'll never forget. I looked at him and I said, what's wrong? He said, the towers fell. I said, 110 story towers don't fall. And then, um, when, I could, didn't watch TV that day. 
And when I got home from work, she was still scared and upset. Upset. So we went to church. She's delivered of a spirit of fear. We came home. She went to sleep and slept all night. I turned on the TV and caught up on the day's news and watched it for three hours and started writing poetry and cried. Uh, for the first time pretty much since my mother had died in 1990. March 17th. Yeah. And uh, I was able to cry and release my emotions, so I started writing poetry, and I've written over 2,300 poems now since September 11, 2001. My twin has written how many stories? 20? Oh, 3,000. Oh, 3,000 stories, and over 400 poems. Huh. She writes a lot about disabilities because we're both disabled, and she wants to change the mindset of society, hiding the disabled as a minor character or as the butt of jokes. She wants to change that and make the disabled person the hero of the story, the central character. And there is a need for that. And I write poetry pretty much about anything, but lately it's been the weather. Because since moving to Texas 25 years ago, it all has some vicious storms here. <laughs> no basements. And no basements. That's the one thing that drives me crazy. They tell you a warning's come and get to your basement. So I build basements, I guess, with my words to hide behind. And uh, out of all those poems, can you can you tell us one? Well, not by memory. I don't have my book with me, but uh, I'll chat. Um, the one I can remember one is about a dog. It's a haiku, which is seventeen syllables. Mm -hmm. Dog is man's best friend. Dog, when spelled backwards, is God. What better tribute? That's one and of them. And then I have one about cat. Attitude with tail. Yes. Scratching, hissing, creatures with occasional purrs. That, yeah, but I, uh, I can kind of remember bits and pieces, but usually when I write them, I just get them down and then I copy them and I've got a book I keep them in. <laughs> but I write a lot about weather um, and it's brought us some I guess some notoriety or fame, I guess. <laughs> and you also take pictures. Karen and I are going to be featured in the Burleson Now magazine in the June issue about our writing. We were just interviewed a couple of weeks ago. The photographer came last week and uh, looking forward to that. And then back in October, a Canadian TV station came down from Canada and filmed us for two days. And because of my poetry about they were um, interviewing people that are either interested in storms or afraid of storms. Well, I'm the chicken, so <laughs> they interviewed me and my twin, and um, they also interviewed a storm chaser out of Canada. And coffee. Yeah, well, anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. He thought he was better than a TV meteorologist. I rely on them very heavily, especially in the spring here, but. Um, they came down and interviewed us, and the second day, she and I were supposed to go to KXAS Studio Channel 5. They messed up her security pass, so she couldn't go. So I got to go by myself and meet the meteorologists and ask them questions. We talked for three hours, and I had written a poem for him, and he really liked it. We still keep in contact. You mentioned that was David Finfrock? David Finfrock, yeah. I've been watching him for years. I watched Dave. Uh, Harold Taft before, and I had met Harold Taft when I was in the Air Force, in fact. He was a colonel in the Air Force, and he was visiting a friend of his on, the, on our floor. And I said, I know who you are. You're, you're Harold Taft. He said, right. And I said, yep, you're from Channel 4 Weather. And he goes, no, we're on Channel. I said, oh, that's right, Channel 8. And he's like, no, we're on Channel. I said, Channel 11? <laughs> no. Oh, Channel 5. Oh, man. That was a very good way to make an impression of <laughs> it. And then um, we talked about that, me and David, how he got thrown in that one time. He had prepared all the weather forecasting, and Harold says, well, I think you can handle this. And they just threw him out there. Oh, boy. So he's been with them over 30 years. 33, I think. I think 32 or 33 years now. Well, tell me, what, what kind of lasting impression has serving in the Air Force left you with? I'm very, very much 
supportive of my troops. Um, being the daughter of the sister of the cousin of the niece of veterans and a veteran myself, I believe that our veterans need to be given the best that the government can give them as a thank you for their service instead of being called in and it seems forgotten. It's not so bad now as it was like during the Vietnam War, but I'm afraid if this war continues to go on, it's going to get that way because everybody's against the war, against the war. Nobody likes war. I don't like war. Um, but I'd rather it be over there than over here. And we need to support our troops and thank our troops and honor our troops. And I am very much appreciative for the Burleson, the city of Burleson, for having this project to honor their troops. And I appreciate it. Well, is there anything else you'd like to say? or Not that I could think of. <laughs> Any, any of those funny stories you want to tell us? Or? Okay, I'll tell one. Oh, okay, <laughs> she likes this one. Um, one time, you in the Air Force? Yes, sir. I know. <laughs> oh, okay. I had worked like two weeks straight of 12 hour shifts. Finally got a day off. So. I was going to sleep all day, and I got to my room, and I was sound asleep, slept all night, was going to sleep the day away. Phone rings. I have to go back to work. They'd had an ice storm, and some of the civilians that lived off post could not come in, so being that I lived on base, I had to go. I didn't have a car, so I slid three miles, walking to the hospital, get there safely. Worked about four hours or so and two of the civilians came in. So they said, well, you got the rest of the day off. Well, thank you very much. So I'm cutting through the base headquarters parking lot, <laughs> and the base commander comes out. Full bird colonel, you have to salute him. I popped a salute. Well, in the middle of the salute, my foot slipped and I fell, landed flat on my back, still holding the salute. And he's <laughs> like, what do you call that? Let's try this again. So I stand up and salute him again. And he said, have a nice day. I said, yes, sir, you too. Well, he turned the corner and down he went. <laughs> Busted his butt. And he whips around, he looks at me and he said, are you laughing at me, Urban? No, sir. <laughs> he said, what? I said, no, sir. <laughs> he said, well, why don't you open your mouth? I know better, sir. I knew if I did, I was gonna lose it. And um, I went over there and helped him up, made sure he was okay and made sure he got into the building okay. Does this colonel have a name? I don't remember his name. <laughs> I really don't. I wish I could remember, but I don't want to embarrass him, but he <laughs> he fell. And uh, my twin sister, every time I tell that story, she laughs at me. Well, thank you very much for doing this interview. I, I, I very much appreciate it. Well, I thank you. Tell the one about Dad. We're continuing mm -hmm. our interview. Okay. Uh, what, what is your next story? Um, I'll tell one that my dad tells me. I don't know if it's true or not, but he tells it to me, and I, I have to believe it's true. My dad was in Japan. One time they went out celebrating, I guess a promotion or something, and they got the brainy idea to ride the bobsled down the mountain. And my dad was the brake man, so he had the honor of pushing the sled down the hill. Well. All the guys jump in and he's pushing the sled down the hill and he goes to jump in the sled and he missed the sled. They take off without a break. They're flying down the hill and then they're getting ready to get to the end of the course and they're yelling, break, 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 where's the brakeman? Well, he's sitting at the top of the hill <laughs> rubbing his rump. <laughs> Crash. Thank God nobody got hurt, but they wound up kicking him off the team. <laughs> That's what he always told tell us. I don't know if it's true, but uh, knowing my dad, it probably is. <laughs> um, and I had one more that um, when I went in the Air Force, I had, when I first joined, they said I couldn't come in because I was too overweight and I needed to lose weight. And I told the recruiter that in a month I would be back and we'll see what happened. Well, I walked a lot, I ran a lot, I did a lot of exercising and I lost something like, what, 30 pounds? Something like that in a month just by dieting and 
running because I was determined to go in the Air Force. I wanted to go. And I walked into the recruiter's office a month later and he said, can I help you? I said, yep, a month ago you told me I was too fat. He's like, holy smoke. Well, um, I went through the MIPS, the military entrance processing system, and uh, it turned out that they wouldn't let me in because of my vision, because I'm so nearsighted. Well, then they said, well, let's send you to a specialist to examine your eye. If there's no active diseases of the eyes, we might be able to let you in. Well, that's what wound up happening. And um, <clears throat> went in the service and got my lovely BC glasses, birth control glasses. They're black frames. Nobody liked them. You wear them. Everyone's like, nerd. <laughs> but anyway, um, nerd. I finally got my glasses, and I was on Ed Carswell one time. And I started having what I call lightning in my vision, just lightning flashes. And it was very bothersome, so I went to the doctor and they had to dilate my pupils and it, they were trying to see if I had a detached retina, which if you're very nearsighted, that's common. Well, it turned out it wasn't that it was a warning that I was fixing to have a migraine. So when I get the lightning flashes, I better take something before that to stave off the migraine. Well, um, it was bright sunny out. I didn't have sunglasses, so I got my eyes squinted. And I'm walking home, and I was cut through the BX parking lot, base exchange. And I hear, Airman! I stop, turn around, squinting. And it was a colonel. Didn't you see my stripes, or my eagle? And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I hope he takes a dump on you. Because <laughs> he was being a real jerk, because I didn't salute him. Well, I didn't see him. How was I supposed to see his him, let alone see his rank? And he looked at me and he said, what in the world is the matter with your eyes? I said, they dilated my pupils, sir. He said, you mean they're letting blind people into the Air Force? I said, they let me in. <laughs> so that was another one of my adventures in the Air Force. Um, that's it. One thing I am proud of is that my Uncle Duke, or who we called him Uncle Duke, my dad's brother Andrew, got to see me in my Air Force uniform. And um, I had gone on leave after my back surgery and I had flown home in my uniform. And uh, we went up to his house. I thought he was gonna swell and explode with pride. I mean, his chest is got huge and he just stood up tall and that meant a lot to me that um, he got to see me in the Air Force uniform. He was carrying on the tradition of our family of a strong military presence. That meant a lot to him and it meant a lot to me. And my daddy was not the kind of man to say I'm proud of you or anything, but he told me he was proud of me when I went through basic training and survived <laughs> and uh, came home. When I got out of the Air Force, I kept telling him, I don't feel like I served. He said, you served, you served. And he always tells me, you served, you served. So that means a lot to him. Yeah, you know, not, to, not to pry, so if you don't want to answer by all means. <laughs> but is, has your son carried on your service? or um, Any nieces or nephews? I have um, cousins that are currently in the military, I believe, in the Marines. <clears throat> I don't know if they're in Iraq or Afghanistan, or where they are, but I do know that um, we still have family members going into the military and continuing the tradition of the Vidra family. Heroes. <laughs> Ready for me to turn this on? Okay. <laughs> 